Well, hello everyone uh, and welcome. We are going to uh, begin this presentation. My name is Paul Schultz. I work within the Center for Excellence in Teaching and Learning. Thank you for being a part of this first College of Arts and Sciences Colloquium of the 2020 Colloquia series entitled COVID-19 Colloquium, What Is It? How to Protect Yourself and Next Steps. I would like to welcome our presenters, Dr. Charles Holmes, Program Chair for Ashford's Masters of Science in Public Health and Chair of the Institutional Research Board, and Carrie Schultz, my wife, Infection Preventionist for Sharp Mary Birch Hospital for Women and Newborn in San Diego, California. You may post questions in the chat while we're giving the presentation, and we will use them to facilitate a question and answer session with the presenters at the end of this webinar. Also, please keep an eye on the chat toward the end of the presentation for a link to an important follow-up survey as we appreciate your feedback. And now, Dr. Charles Holm. Well, thank you, Paul, and uh, hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Uh, the goal for this presentation is for um, us to provide uh, those in attendance with factual information that they can use going forward to make appropriate decisions on how to protect themselves and those around them uh, from COVID-19. Uh, I am my co-presenter, uh, Mrs. Carrie Schultz. Uh, make no claims to have all the answers, uh, but between us, we should be able to try and answer most of your questions today. Uh, that being said, given that we are on a, a tighter timeline with this uh, national colloquium, um, I would ask that you please hold your questions until the end. Um, and I have tried to make the data as accurate as possible. Um, you'll see as we progress, though, that uh, keeping everything in real time is uh, next to impossible. Uh, the first area I'd like to address is misinformation. Uh, sadly, the information you receive from most popular sources is going to contain inaccurate information. Uh, so what have you heard that can protect you or increase your chances of getting COVID-19? Uh, I mean, put those things in the chat if you like. Um, some of my favorites, uh, Fox News and Geraldo Rivera, if you're familiar with him, uh, recommended holding your breath. Uh, if you can hold your breath for 10 seconds, then that's a clear sign you don't have COVID-19. Uh, that is not accurate. Uh, keeping your mouth moist. Uh, this was from Japanese experts on a, a mass circulating email. Uh, apparently a moist mouth is something that COVID-19 doesn't like. Um, <laughs> it's actually the opposite of that. Um, yeah, if you have a moist mouth, uh, you're going to uh, probably create more droplets and you're going to be able to take in more droplets. So it's, that's also false. Uh, taking a bath can prevent you from getting COVID-19. Uh, that's also false. Uh, taking a bath is good hygiene. Um, washing your skin, making sure that you're clean is good, uh, but in no way, you know, gives you any side of permanent protection. Uh, wiping your skin with Lysol wipes, that was probably the most concerning one I've seen. Um, absolutely do not do that. Uh, don't wipe yourself down with those cleaning wipes like bleach or Lysol. Absolutely do not do that. Um, but there's a lot of misconceptions and uh, poor information out there. Uh, and the main area of concern is that given the severity of this situation, misinformation at this point can cause some very serious consequences. Uh, up to and including death. Um, regardless of your politics, even the comments made by the President of the United States often contain inaccurate information and advice. Uh, so what I would recommend is the best resource for information in the United States um, remains to be the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention. And the lead for physicians that are on this task force are Dr. Tony Fauci and Dr. Deborah Burks. Their information um, has consistently been accurate. Uh, so that is the best source of information. Um, on this uh, pandemic that we're facing. So what is coronavirus? Um, first, think of coronavirus like a family name, um, and COVID-19 is a specific name within that. Um, in total, there are seven types of coronavirus that impact humans, and about three are considered to cause really severe reactions. Ultimately, COVID-19 is a variant of the cold virus. Um, they have rhinovirus and coronavirus. Um, but they can be seen both as very good and very, very bad, being this closely linked to a cold virus. It's very good because it's easily killed um, and cleaned, and it's very bad because it's highly infectious. 
Uh, as mentioned, COVID-19 is a variant of a virus that frequently causes cold-like symptoms. Uh, what is unique about COVID-19 is that like SARS, it originated in China and was not immediately reported when it was discovered. This creates a host of issues um, on the world stage because we cannot prepare supplies or work to develop treatments in the world if we are unaware of it. Um, COVID-19 is lethal primarily because of the impact that it's having on the host lungs and it essentially prevents the mechanism designed to remove foreign bodies and excess mucus from the lungs. Uh, this lack of removal impedes the transmission or uh, transition of oxygen and CO2 exchange um, and makes breathing more difficult. That's why you hear about labored breathing and coughing. Um, your body's trying to expel things, but it's just unable to do it efficiently. Um, and it's more advanced stages. It can also have severe impacts on kidney function, which when combined with the lung impairment, uh, can result in organ system failures. And that's what um, my wife, who's a forensic pathologist, is seeing um, in her situations is that when individuals are coming in with COVID-19, um, they are, their kidneys, their lungs, it's an entire body that's being impacted. It's not just the lungs. It starts in the lungs, and that's why you have to be proactive whenever you um, get a sense of those symptoms. So epidemiology um, is a key function of public health, and Essentially, it's our way of tracking the spread. So uh, epidemiology is a term that we use for basically data tracking. Uh, the first case was potentially discovered in November of 2019, but it was not announced. Uh, by December of 2019, over 60 cases were present with still no acknowledgement to scientists or physicians outside of China that this even existed. And this, unfortunately, was similar to what we faced uh, when SARS developed. Uh, during these initial months, Chinese physicians were being jailed or threatened if they attempted to discuss uh, with parties outside of the country uh, what was happening. Um, so it left us somewhat unknown uh, to how the virus was behaving. Now that we know the virus behaves similar to SARS, we can do some work, but it's COVID-19 is far more contagious, so the growth of infected individuals became too large for China to hide. Since the virus was discovered, the world has over a million confirmed cases. That happened yesterday. Um, and more than 55,000 fatalities. The U.S. has by far the largest number of infected individuals, and that is mostly due to the delayed action on the part of our federal government and local government agencies and implementing um, really firm stay-at-home orders. Uh, with correcting misinformation, no state or county in the United States should be under the impression they're without COVID-19 virus. Um, the, it's simply not been found yet. We just don't have the testing kits available um, but I don't want anyone leaving this presentation thinking that they're in a location that's, you know, free of COVID-19. Um, you may be in an area that has, you know, fewer cases of it, but the idea that it's, you know, you're somehow immune to it or your area is not going to be impacted by it um, is false. Uh, due to a lack of national testing, it makes reliable data very difficult for us to obtain, and that's really what public health thrives upon. Um, additionally, states that do have low numbers frequently um, are having governors that are touting their success, uh, but when examined, the amount of tests that they've actually conducted are minimal. Uh, one state that comes to mind is Kentucky. Um, how the, their governor is touting their containment methods are superior to those of the neighboring states of uh, Indiana and Tennessee, which have more cases. Uh, this is not the case. Indiana and Tennessee have conducted far more COVID-19 testing, so they have far more reported infections. Kentucky's under-reporting and under-testing people because it gives the impression that Kentucky has fewer infections and the governor has somehow done some uh, magic trick in keeping everybody you know, really well contained. Um, and unfortunately, that's just not the case. In the coming slides, we will discuss how COVID-19 is most commonly spread, uh, what data we're seeing related to the virus and what can be done uh, to protect one another. So how is it spread? Uh, as you've most certainly seen on television or in the news, uh, COVID-19 is spread via respiratory droplets that expel when someone coughs or sneezes. Um, I don't want you to leave also thinking that that's the only way that it can be transmitted. Uh, when you talk closely with one, another person, with your spouse, whomever it may be, um, droplets and things like that can be expelled. So coughs and sneezes are obviously the, you can see by the image, that's when they expel really far, um, about six feet, um, but they can be expelled just in general communication as well. Um, this is why we're being asked to self-isolate. Uh, for example, if you have an individual who's infected but asymptomatic, they could cough into their hand or rub their nose and then place that hand on a surface or the virus can remain active for hours. Um, the issue is not that the individual's walking around knowingly getting other people sick. 
uh, but rather they're walking around not knowing they're sick and spreading the virus to others unintentionally. That's, that's the issue that we're facing um, from a public health standpoint. So that's why we want you to stay at home so you can't inadvertently spread it. Um, the incubation for this virus is five to 11 days, um, on average about 10 days here in Colorado, uh, meaning that if you become infected, it could take five to 11 days for you to become symptomatic, for you to have that fever, the cough, the, you know, any of the other symptoms that go along with it. So that's where it becomes a little bit more fearful in that we cannot immediately notify individuals when they have the virus because, you know, you could be asymptomatic. Um, at the top there of the slide, you can see community spread. Uh, community spread means that people have been infected by the virus in an area, including some who are not sure how or where they acquired it. Um, that's by far the most frequent um, instance. Most people do not know where they're acquiring the virus from. And then we're also seeing exponential growth, meaning the rate of the infection is far outpacing the time equivalent um, for a virus of this type. Uh, many people like to use influenza as a comparison to COVID-19, um, but the seasonal flu has a mortality rate of less than 1%, so the severity of COVID-19 would be seen as 300 to 400% higher. Um, you may also hear that influenza is far worse each year uh, than what we're currently experiencing. Uh, while it is true that U.S. infections and mortality totals associated with the influenza are higher, uh, we had 38 million um, in the 2019 flu season, uh, become infected in about 24,000 fatalities. Um, the, the main cause is, again, the, the rate of infection, the higher mortality rate that's associated with COVID-19, and the fact that this is still an uncontrolled virus. That's why healthcare professionals are seriously concerned. We've dealt with influenza before. Um, it's, you know, a very serious illness, but we're familiar with it. COVID-19 is something we are unfamiliar with, and that's why the action that you take um, personally is so important. Um, what is also interesting to note uh, from the CDC chart um, is that COVID-19 cases uh, were listed at approximately 500,000 on March 30th, and today the number exceeds a million. And just to think in that span of, you know, just a few days, we've more than doubled uh, the rate of infection worldwide um, is, again, a great cause for concern. Uh, this is a live tracking map that the New York Times has done, and I think it's just really, really clever what they've chosen to do. Um, their journalists, uh, their investigators are actually tracking the individuals with the virus as opposed to the states. So you can actually find where the clusters are located at. Um, what's important about this also is it does give some really interesting data because early on we had individuals that were say flying from California to Florida and both states were claiming that individual is an infection. And what the New York Times and their investigators have done is actually find the ver person who is infected, find out where they're located and make sure that that state is properly um, being accounted for. So it's a very, very useful map. Um, so if you're interested in it, yeah, I would recommend the New York Times uh, coronavirus map. The idea with the concept of exponential growth in mind though, on a daily average, the world is seeing about 50,000 new cases of COVID-19 and the US is seeing around 25,000. Uh, the area is anticipated to see the largest surges of new cases are Southern California, uh, Chicago, Southern Florida, and the Metropolitan Triangle in Dallas, or excuse me, Metropolitan Triangle in Texas, that'd be Dallas, San Antonio, Houston, those uh, communities that are kind of in that area um, are likely gonna see a large surge. Um, and as testing becomes more readily available, the number of infected persons uh, we will see on a daily basis likely will jump to 100,000 worldwide and 50,000 in the United States. We'll talk about some of the testing later on um, but like any disease, uh, cancer included, as tests become more refined and more quick, we start to see more cases. Um, so again, I don't want anyone leaving with the impression that they're somehow um, in a space that's completely immune from COVID-19. Uh, it likely just has not been found yet. So who is at the greatest risk? Uh, the Center for Disease Control and the World Health Organization highlight that those who are at greatest risk for severe complications and death are those age 65 and older. I listed 60 as the charts to come will show that the five-year age difference between 60 and 65 um, really has not demonstrated itself to be a buffer. Um, we're seeing the same amounts of fatalities and the same amount of infections and the same severities in individuals who are 60 as they are at 65. So why they chose that as a cutoff, I'm not entirely certain. Um, additionally, at significant risk are those individuals with um, significant underlying health conditions or comorbidities. 
Um, comorbidities, uh, for those of you not familiar with them, is an additional illness. So if you take someone who, let's say, has asthma, that's a morbidity or a sickness. You have asthma. And then let's say that same individual also has diabetes. That's also a sickness. Um, so that would, if the individual has asthma and diabetes, that would be a comorbidity. So co-sicknesses, two sicknesses together. So that increases your likelihood of um, having a severe complication with COVID-19. The area of greatest concern um, for those who will suffer from lung conditions, um, those are the ones that we're trying to keep an eye on the most. Um, individuals with asthma, COPD, emphysema, chronic bronchitis, uh, cystic fibrosis, um, those are um, really, really problematic uh, associated with COVID-19 because that seems to be the first area that's impacted by the virus is the lungs. Um, also, those with weakened immune systems due to age or health condition. Um, I know with my sister, she had to uh, thankfully uh, has overcome stage four colon cancer, but she is extreme, still at extreme risk because she's endured so much chemotherapy and radiation, she is going to be immunocompromised. Um, if you're a transplant re recipient, excuse me, you also are immunocompromised. You're taking anti, you know, retro medication to keep uh, your immune system from attacking this organ. That's going to place you at greater risk. Uh, racial or gender preference. Uh, today, COVID-19 has not shown any preference for race, ethnicity, or gender. Uh, there are some studies that are going on right now that are showing early signs that males may be more at more risk, um, but that data is also showing that men typically have more health conditions uh, than their female counterparts, so it's not really a, a balanced uh, study yet, and that men also engage in riskier study, uh, riskier behaviors, excuse me, um, not social distancing as diligently. Um, I know personally, we have a 14 month old at home and my wife is a physician, so she's um, exposed far more than I would like her to. So if it requires us to go to the grocery store every two weeks, I'm the one that takes that risk because I want to minimize the risk to my wife and our daughter. Um, so that's one of the reasons why men may be showing higher numbers. Um, as far as fatalities, again, it probably goes back to the additional health conditions and the lack of social distancing. Uh, this graph highlights the exponential growth of COVID-19 infections in the United States. Uh, below the graph, I have provided the list of key dates. Uh, for example, the CDC recognizes the first U.S. case being identified on January 22nd of this year. One month later, we had 15 cases, and just another month later, we had over 40,000. What is particularly interesting is the growth seen in the month of March, and so I tried to provide, you know, some of the key dates for March. Um, with the virus being fairly well proliferated throughout the United States by March 1st, we can see that in the span of just 30 days, over 160,000 people in the U.S. became infected. Um, you can also see that in the early weeks of March, the infections consistently increased by more than 100% each day. What is most concerning to me uh, from a public health perspective, aside from the collected data, which is uh, disturbing, is the amount of individuals that are infected but not ha have not yet been able to acquire testing. I've had multiple faculty reach out to me via email sharing their stories of how they are symptomatic, but short of being on their deathbeds, they simply are not in a state that has enough testing swabs. Um, this is not uncommon and this is a problem. This is quite scary. Um, it creates a false sense of security in many areas because many lay individuals can look at one of the graphs or these charts or these maps that I'm showing you and say, well, my county's only showing that we have one positive infection. So, you know, I'm safe to resume my normal activities. Uh, here in Douglas County, Colorado, where I live, we have a little more than 120 cases. And every day when I go out to um, drop my daughter off at daycare so we can, you know, continue to work, the, I'll see individuals with four-wheelers uh, attached to their Jeeps. They're going out there engaging in social activities. That absolutely should not be occurring. Um, this is, you know, do not believe the map just as a map alone. See it as a, you know, fluid situation. Every county in the United States likely has COVID-19. Whether it's been found is the determining factor and testing kits are really are what going to be required for public health to have that, that data and really know how to proceed forward. This graph is similar to the previous, but highlights the infection rates of age throughout the world. So this is sort of the uh, morbidity again is sickness. So these are the ages of individuals who are most frequently acquiring the illness. Um, this was somewhat early in the COVID-19 outbreak, but the chart will show um, as time progresses. And thankfully, once we get to the end of this uh, pandemic, the bell curve will maintain itself. So those between the ages of 30 and 70 
are the most likely to acquire the virus and what should not be overlooked um, is that the number of individuals who are truly infected versus those who have been tested, um, again, is an unknown quantity. We just do not have enough testing. The, despite what you may hear um, from the president or your county officials, whatever it may be, a lot of individuals, unfortunately, are trying to politicize this. Um, and this is not a political event. This is um, a threat to all of mankind. And it needs to be treated as such. And everyone really needs to do their best um, to follow the recommendations and to acquire testing whenever it is made available to you. This graph demonstrates the worldwide mortality or death rate associated with COVID-19. Uh, if you recall from one of the earlier slides where I adjusted the uh, CDC or World Health recommendation from 65 uh, down to 60, it's because again, the data simply does not support that a buffer exists between someone who's 60 versus someone who's 65. Uh, what this graph also shows is that even though those who are 70 years uh, or older only account for maybe 12% of the COVID-19 cases worldwide. They account for 50% of the fatalities. And additional 30% of the fatalities or deaths uh, are in the 60 to 69 year old age group. Meaning that approximately 80% of all deaths related to COVID-19 are occurring in individuals older than 60. This is why social distancing and in those individuals who are older than 60 years of age, isolation really is the key to protecting yourself. Um, you know, ordering your groceries, minimizing out external trips, uh, not engaging with, you know, anyone closer than six feet. Uh, it, it really, really is important. Um, it's a, a disease that has a high mortality rate. And as you saw earlier, the contagious rate, uh, contagion rate of this disease is just off the charts. We've never been able to track the common cold because people really don't report the common cold, but this seems to be spreading at the same rate as that. And it's quite alarming. So general prevention recommendations, uh, hopefully you've all seen these. Um, Self-isolation uh, is definitely by far the, the greatest thing you can do. Uh, no contact with people results in no chance of obtaining the virus. If you don't have the virus and you're not interacting with anyone that does, you're, you're safe. Um, wash your hands often with soap and water for at least 20 seconds. Um, I think the common recommendation is to sing happy birthday, uh, the happy birthday song twice. Um, and one thing that, uh, has come across in some of these mass emails uh, where people are demonstrating washing their hands. The 20 seconds is for washing the lathering of the soap on your hands. Don't, don't put soap on your hands and then just run them under water for 20 seconds. That's kind of defeating the purpose. It's the soap running across your hands for 20 seconds while you're wringing it out. That's what's going to make the difference. Then you can wash your hands off. Um, if soap and water are not available, uh, use alcohol-based hand sanitizers. Um, I list here greater than 60% alcohol by volume. Most of the things you interact with or purchase um, are going to be greater than 60% Purell, uh, things like that. But it is worth looking. Uh, if you just flip over the back, you'll see on the label the active ingredient, and then it should give you the, uh, the alcohol by volume. Uh, some of the print is pretty small, um, but uh, yeah, it, it is worth checking. Uh, avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. Even with washed hands, um, we really want to get out of the habit as people of uh, touching our face. This is how the virus is going to, you know, get to you. Um, if you have the virus on your hands and you touch a mucous membrane, that's how it's going to transition in. So if you touch your mouth, your nose, your eyes, that's how it's going to get access to you. Um, so it's a very, very difficult habit to break. I think the, you know, the average person touches their face uh, before COVID-19 around 30 times an hour. Um, really, really work uh, to keep your hands away from your face if you can. Um, then always cover your mouth and nose with a, a tissue um, if you're coughing or sneezing. Um, they list sleeve. Uh, if you cough or, you know, if you're outside and you cough into your uh, sleeve, that's fine. Uh, sneeze into your sleeve. Uh, but do try and uh, change your clothes soon. Um, you don't want to walk around with um, whatever it is that you expelled um, and then go interact with uh, your family or loved ones. Uh, this is just simply a... Uh, a placard that is being displayed in most travel sites. Um, most states and countries have already placed travel bans in place, but in case there was still a question with any of you, uh, do not travel. Uh, it's just not advised, not even from, you know, state to state, you know, stay where you are, shelter in place. Um, that's, that's the best thing that you can do for, for everyone around you. Um, some more advanced precautions or things that you can do for yourself uh, from a public health perspective. Um, Disconnecting from the media is a big recommendation. Uh, the media will cause you untold amounts of stress 
Uh, and whether the information be accurate or inaccurate, if you're properly self-isolating yourself and doing all the things that you're supposed to do in your home, you know, cleaning, washing your hands, disinfecting, the amount of external information you need um, is minimal. And finding out more and more information, you know, the cresting of one million infected, things like that, it's useful to know, but it's not something that you need to inundate yourself with on an hourly basis. Uh, I know phone notifications um, can really be a stressor for a lot of people. Feel welcome to deactivate those um, to, again, try and reduce the amount of stress that you have in your life. Um, for keeping perspective, uh, COVID-19 is still the coronavirus, meaning that it can easily be killed. Um, using basic household cleaners, Lysol, um, the basic disinfectant wipes, things like that. You do not need to bleach everything. Uh, bleach is going to kill it, but it's a bit overkill. Um, coronavirus is the cold virus. It will be killed naturally. Um, how to handle packages delivered to your home. Um, wearing gloves. Uh, sterile gloves are ideal if you can, and especially if you know how to take them off properly. That's usually the main issue that we run into. Um, or just general gardening or winter gloves. Um, if you have a package, doesn't have anything perishable in it, you know, you can place it in the sunlight uh, for a couple of days and the UV rays from the sun uh, are magical in the way that they uh, are able to kill most every virus. So if you can do that, that's great. If you can't, uh, using gloves, pick up the item, uh, open it up, remove whatever it is that's in there uh, that you need, throw the package away, uh, wash your hands if you're wearing gloves at the time, you know, wash the gloves as well or dispose of them. Uh, if you're insistent upon seeing guests, um, I don't know that anyone is, but in the Midwest, I know a lot of the um, states are still not doing shelter in place orders, uh, and there's a few southern states, sadly. Um, so if you are seeing guests, ideally meet with them outside, uh, again, more than six feet apart. Uh, again, the ultraviolet light from the sun will help uh, to protect you and that distance will also help. Um, if you, they must be indoors, uh, have them wash or sanitize their hands immediately upon entry. Uh, don't shake hands, don't hug, don't kiss, um, you know, keep your distance. Um, sit at least six feet from them and try and set up a space where your guests can consistently sit. And I say consistently because that, you know, if every guest is going to that same chair, then you know that's the area that needs to be disinfected when they leave. Um, but again, I can't strongly recommend enough uh, self-isolation uh, and try not to engage with any guests in your home uh, just because again, that incubation period, you're never certain um, if someone is, has the virus and just isn't symptomatic. What to do if you're feeling ill? Uh, the incubation period again uh, is the time between being exposed to the virus and when the symptoms will actually start. Uh, and the great threat with COVID-19 is that many young people are asymptomatic throughout the entire thing. So where I say an incubation period of five to 11, that's for people who are becoming symptomatic. If you are asymptomatic, you could have the virus and not know it. And that's, again, one of the reasons um, why we're doing the shelter in place laws. Um, so with the incubation period of five to 11, even a conscientious adult can acquire and spread the virus without having symptoms. If the person does have symptoms, that's when they are most contagious. And that's what our healthcare workers uh, like uh, our uh, co-presenter Carrie Schultz are facing. If individuals are coming and they're, let's say, at the peak of, you know, their contagious ability there, you know, they have the fever, they have the cough, they're having difficulty breathing. We need our healthcare professionals to have those N95 masks, the face shields, everything they need because that person is at the peak of being contagious. And that's where, uh, you know, a disconnect is occurring where I'll see people walking around with masks on. Masks are all well and good, but unless you're wearing safety glasses and gloves, you know, if somebody coughs and you walk into it, sure your mouth and nose are protected, but it's still gonna hit your eyes. So the, you're gonna see some changes probably coming on uh, from a public health perspective on using masks. Um, I would recommend you watch some videos on how to properly put on a mask um, or a bandana. I think we're recommending basically anything but N95 masks. We need to save those for uh, health professionals. But again, avoiding contact with as many people as possible is gonna be the big help here. Um, and also seeking emergency medical attention if you have difficulty breathing or persistent pain, uh, blue tinge to your lips or face or a fever greater than 103. Um, we have a lot of cases where individuals who are not in that 60 plus age group are passing away because they are either, you know, have a comorbidity or in some cases are waiting too long to seek medical care. Um, I know of a gentleman, uh, he was highlighted from Texas uh, in his early 40s very active, very healthy, had a family of six and his wife. 
he wasn't feeling well, he was tested, he tested positive for COVID-19, he self-isolated himself, which he was supposed to do, he did great, wore a mask, but in his case, he waited too long. His breathing became so labored that he actually had to have, you know, he could not breathe properly. His fever spiked, and by the time they got into the emergency room, he was already an organ system failure and there was nothing that could be done. So if you cross that threshold, um, where you are symptomatic and you are seeing these high fever spikes, you are having difficulty breathing, call your primary care physician, um, call your emergency room, let them know that you know, you're on your way and that you have COVID-19 symptoms. Each county in the United States has a plan and you can go to your county website to see what they recommend. Um, you know, maybe it's, it varies a little bit, but that's the general guidelines that we're recommending is that if you are sick and you have these real symptoms and you're going to try to go to a healthcare facility, Call them in advance, let them know you're coming and that you have COVID-19 symptoms. Um, my public health uh, professional estimations, um, as noted in a recent presidential address, uh, the coming weeks are likely gonna be the worst yet. Um, this is definitely gonna get worse before it gets better and for major cities, um, it's gonna get severely worse uh, before it gets better. Uh, based on tracking and projections, uh, we're likely nearing the first surge and we'll see more infections and fatalities in this first surge. So you're gonna see numbers spike and that should be expected. I don't want you to take that as an additional alarm that things are getting worse. This is the natural progression of a virus. Um, and if you self-isolate and do all the precautions you're supposed to, um, you will be okay. Um, in my estimation, once the other major cities in the US begin to catch up on testing uh, and the symptoms in the US will probably surpass a million. Uh, we'll probably get to a million infected individuals in the US um, and 100,000 deaths. Um, I'm, I'm very hopeful that people will heed the warnings and do all the things they're supposed to do, but uh, that seems to be the trend. Uh, people are just, you know, they're stir crazy. They've got cabin fever, you know, like, it, you know, the people I see with their four wheelers going out, um, it just creates problems. Uh, the interactions you're people are having with one another, uh, family outings, things like that, um, they all really need to be stopped for at least the remainder of the month. Um, the spike I'm seeing though is due to a variety of reasons, primarily the delayed government response, uh, the vast shortage that we have in testing supplies, I can't stress that enough, and the lack of uniform social distancing and isolation. Again, having a lot of the states in the Midwest not enact things because uh, I think the governor of Oklahoma said it was inconvenient uh, to implement social distancing. Um, I can assure you that the state of California, the state of New York, state of Colorado, Illinois, we're not social distancing because it's convenient. Uh, we like it. Uh, it's, that's not the case. We're doing it because we have to do it and it's for the benefit of everyone. So those states in the Midwest, if you live in one of those states that are not socially isolating, take it upon yourself to at least socially isolate, do your part uh, to help and we can hope that um, others will catch up to your intelligence. What are my estimations based upon? Um, most states that have more than a thousand infections are already seeing the impacts within their healthcare system. Uh, there is a mass shortage of personal protective equipment or PPE. Uh, you've probably seen that on the news. Um, you know, the N95 masks, face shields, uh, things like that. Uh, ventilators, uh, we have a shortage of beds, we have a shortage of ICU facilities. Um, we're also seeing a shortage of medical professionals. Um, to date, I think 25,000 nurses and physicians have come out of retirement. Uh, to try and help, and it's just not going to be enough. Um, if we don't have enough personal protective equipment, people are, physicians and educated professionals are going to be sick, and then we're taking away their knowledge. So again, like with my co-presenter, um, Mrs. Schultz, if she, she has a vast amount of knowledge on this topic and how to help people and how to protect people. If she goes into a situation and becomes sick, we lose her knowledge. We lose her skill set because she didn't have the personal protective equipment she needed. That's why it's so important for you not to hoard supplies or anything like that that um, healthcare professionals really need. Um, this is when the difficult decisions, though, unfortunately, are gonna have to be made. Um, we've seen it in Italy and we've started to see it in New York um, where patients are basically sat side by side and physicians have to make that difficult decision of who gets the treatment. You know, we don't have enough ventilators. Okay, which of these two individuals is more likely to survive? This is the person that's gonna get the ventilator and for the other person, we'll do as much as we can um, with what we have. Um, it's a very scary situation uh, for a lot of hospitals. And uh, my wife just got a posting earlier today on her uh, pathology forum that physicians are being disciplined now for speaking out about the conditions that their hospital is facing. Um, 
which again defies my defies logic. Um, I understand not wanting to raise social alarm, but if someone is saying, "Hey, we need you know masks," and people are kind enough to bring them and donate them, I, I'm all for it. Um, but the idea of punishing someone for you know saying what's happening uh, again defies public health logic. Progress. Uh, fortunately, as with any world impacting event, many groups have stepped forward in an effort to help us. Uh, major manufacturing facilities are retooling to make ventilators. Uh, clothing manufacturers are now making scrubs and uh, surgical masks. The pharmaceutical companies throughout the world are trying to improve the speed of testing and develop vaccines. Uh, the ones that I'm most aware of, um, our Abbott Labs has demonstrated a machine that's able to provide rapid COVID-19 results in just five to 15 minutes. That's fantastic. Um, right now here in Denver, we're waiting four hours to, you know, days, depending on the facility. Uh, so for a rapid test, like you have with a rapid flu test, um, to be available is amazing. Obviously, they're making them as quickly as they can, and they're distributing throughout the world. Um, I think Colorado is getting a, a batch in today, but we need them as, you know, we needed them a couple weeks ago, uh, but I'm very thankful they're here now. Um, Additionally, Johnson & Johnson have a working prototype for a vaccine um, that has been approved for testing. It's still gonna take probably 12 to 18 months to actually see any uh, viability or actually get out into the public, um, but it is a positive. Um, and then finally, the northern portion of Italy, um, Italy still has the most uh, fatalities due to COVID-19 and by population, they are so small compared to the United States with th over 330 million people. Um, so I'm very grateful to see that their curve is leveling off um, and that they're seeing a decrease in deaths. Um, but it's, it does demonstrate social distancing is working, but it also demonstrates what happens um, if you wait uh, too long to implement uh, positive controls. So is all hope lost? Never. Absolutely not. Um, <laughs> I feel bad having to highlight all the negatives associated with COVID-19 um, and how serious this virus is to all of mankind. Um, but I want to make sure that from a public health perspective, especially with my background as a public health educator, that you have accurate information so that you can share that with your loved ones and those around you um, on what really is going on, how they should read maps, and what's important. Um, this virus will be contained and protected for future generations. This is not a matter of if, but when. Um, if the entire world's impacted, uh, the entire world comes together to try and solve the problem. Um, our world will be forever changed though, due to this virus. Um, so my hope is that we can all strive to make the change a positive one. Um, but uh, now it is absolutely my distinct pleasure to introduce our infectious disease expert. Um, please welcome Mrs. Carrie Schultz. Carrie is a native San Diegan and received her BSN from San Diego State University. Uh, she has an extensive experience as a clinician in neonatal intensive care unit and has been in the role of infection preventionist for Sharp Mary Birch Hospital for women and newborns since October of 2008. She has served on the board of San Diego and Piro County Association for Professionals and Infection Control, and included, uh, that includes serving in the role of president. Uh, Carrie also has her CIC, or Certification in Infection Prevention and Control, which signifies internationally recognized expertise. So what I'd like to do now is ask a, a few uh, generalized questions that I see come up um, to our infectious control expert, Carrie. Um, so, Carrie, if you could tell us a little bit about your health background and education. Yeah, thanks, Charles. Um, yeah, I've been a nurse uh, since 1983, and I graduated here at San Diego State uh, School of Nursing. I've mostly been in uh, neonatal ICU for most of my career, and then, as Charles said, I became an infection control nurse, or now they call us infection preventionists, uh, for, uh, it's been about 11, 11 and a half years. So um, I've studied infection prevention, and that is the area of preventing the spread of infection and protecting uh, our hospitals and our healthcare workers and staff and visitors from, uh, from diseases and infections in the hospital. So that is my background. Outstanding. And what is your specific role within your healthcare facility or the greater San, greater San Diego area? I saw that you mentioned you're part of a, a larger chapter. Right, so all of the infection preventionists uh, in the county, San Diego County and Imperial County, uh, we come together, we collaborate, we meet monthly, uh, we have conferences um, nationally, uh, actually internationally as well. 
And, um, you know, there's just a lot of collaboration. So my specific role in San Diego uh, for this, uh, I work for a women and newborn hospital in a, a larger uh, Sharp Healthcare. So um, because I am the only uh, freestanding women's hospital in San Diego, and actually I even believe in California, uh, I can be a resource for other um, hospitals that have delivery centers and have neonatal intensive care units. So we collaborate a lot in the county and then we, we share a lot of information with each other. So that's a great part about being a part of the APEC chapter. Excellent. Um, what responsibilities come along with being in charge of infectious diseases for your, um, the SHARP system you're a part of? So I specifically, um, you know, I'm an educator in that sense. Um, I am responsible for writing and collaborating and consulting on, you know, policies for infection prevention, uh, visitation policies, um, preventing, you know, device associated infections, which of course has been a big movement, especially in our, our country to prevent hospital associated infections. So breaking that chain of infection, whether it be people with central lines or on ventilators, um, my specific area of expertise is in the neonatal ICU. It's the only ICU in my facility uh, because I have, I have a sister hospital right next door to mine that if a, a mother became uh, too ill to stay in our facility and needed a greater level of care that she could go right across the, the walkway into Sharp Memorial. So we collaborate in that way. And so specifically, I, I work in, within the walls of the women's hospital. And, and like I said, become a resource. We have other women's centers in the Sharp Center or in healthcare and then in the county. So, Thank you. The, so given your background and your expertise, what are your primary concerns as a, you know, I'm on the public health side, you're on the acute care side. What are your primary concerns with COVID-19? So they're probably very similar to everybody else's concerns because it's an unknown. Um, I was a a brand new infection preventionist when H1N1 uh, came on the scene. I was actually traveling to my epi training on the East Coast when all the signs came out and people started wearing masks on the airplanes. And um, that particular uh, pandemic was very scary for uh, pregnant women and for children. And so um, COVID's been a little different in that uh, because it's not particularly uh, targeting as far as severity of illness for pregnant women and for for newborns and neonates in my case. So that that's been a good thing about it. Uh, but I'm definitely concerned. I think, you know, the areas of, of the protective equipment for healthcare workers, um, that is a huge problem. It's a huge fear for those uh, that are frontline and right there at the bedside. And and just the whole fear factor of the unknown. Um, it's, it's almost like, as far as where San Diego is right now and where my specific hospital is, we have tested probably four or five women in the last week or two. None of them have been positive. So we have not had a positive. We have actually tested one baby that had family members that had traveled. Um, so as far as watching this disease, I haven't had to in my hospital. Uh, but the concern is almost that fear factor of, of not knowing what's going to happen, waiting to see if our, um, our protective equipment is going to last, uh, what could be happening on the horizon. That's, that's probably the, the greatest concern that we have right now. Yeah, no, I completely agree. The unknown um, and the speed at which things are working is quite concerning. Yeah. Uh, do you feel that Greater San Diego has the capacity to handle the expected patient load? Mm -hmm. um, and if not, have, are you aware of public health contingencies that are being put in place? So San Diego has done a, a really good job of collaborating. Uh, all the hospitals have um, collaborative meetings, you know, Skype meetings um, with public health where we're very prepared, our disaster preparedness. We started our disaster committee a few years ago with Ebola and it's consistently uh, met the highly infectious disease committee. Uh, we've been actually meeting 
uh, daily for the last few weeks uh, in the morning on a call, collaborating uh, within our facilities and then the hospitals as well. So it's really hard to tell San Diego's doing well right now and we're expecting every week we kind of go, well, it's gonna be, our surge is gonna come in seven to eight days. And then the following week we go, well, it looks like it's going to come in seven to eight days. And then the following week, we, you know, now they're sort of projecting, um, I think it's April 26th uh, is going to hit. So it's, it's very difficult to know if you're ready. Where our, our planning committees are, you know, let's over prepare and then we'll be ready for whatever comes. So I, I feel like San Diego's done a really good job. We are not seeing the level of cases uh, in some of the other uh, you know, larger mid-sized cities like we are. Um, LA has been hit harder than us. I do feel like our city in general is doing a good job of, uh, you know, sheltering in place, so to speak. Um, so I don't know, it's, it's hard to know if we're ready. I, I think we are, I feel like we are. Um, but again, the whole protective equipment thing is, is quite a challenge because, you know, the county may get a, a cash of a delivery of masks from the state and and may deliver to us 20,000. But we burn through, even right now, with just the level of care that we're giving in our SHARP facilities, we probably use eight to 995 masks a day. And so if they deliver, you know, 20,000, then, you know, we've we've got about 20 days. So yeah. it's it's very challenging to know what's gonna hit. Yes. No, and the, the for or those of us or for those in the room, the what I meant by uh, or what Dr. Um, Schultz mentioned was the uh, disaster preparedness. That's what you're seeing in New York. Um, so when they were talked about, you know, when they showed those tents that are being put into Central Park, that is public health disaster preparedness. Mm -hmm. They're implementing plans that have been put in place many, many years ago because they are seeing an overwhelming. Uh, overload of their healthcare system. Mm -hmm. So uh, San Diego, uh, I know here in Denver, um, we've started to requisition uh, like interior sports courts and arenas mm -hmm. because those are gonna be overflow areas and I would imagine San Diego is likely mm -hmm. doing something similar, just getting prepared um, should the worst happen. Yeah. And then uh, finally, uh, Ms. Schultz, what are your uh, recommendations to private citizens? Well, they're exactly what yours have been that, um, that we all follow the directives uh, that are being given to us, they're for a reason. And um, I know in some places in the country, the shelter in place was too late. Uh, I feel like in San Diego, it, it was timely, it was early. I do believe that's why we've flattened the curve a bit here so far. Um, I do think as people get sort of cabin fever, it's interesting because those of us in healthcare, we've been going to work every day working 10, 11, 12 hour days. And then I can't wait to get home. <laughs> I'm waiting to shelter in place. Um, I'm happy to do that, but I know it's not true. You know, Paul's been working from home and it's very hard for him to, to stay there uh, and not get, get to go out and see our friends and do the things we normally do. And I, my fear is that as people um, get tired of doing that and they do see the curve flattening, they do see the lower level of cases are, are perhaps when places start to, to drop those cases, then they're gonna feel free to go out. And that is uh, where an exposure can happen. So I do feel like, you know, that the hand hygiene and all that, it's, it warms my heart as an infection preventionist that uh, our, this generation of our small children are learning how to wash their hands. They're not even, old enough to, to reach the sink and they're learning uh, hand hygiene. So, and, you know, seeing people like Ellen, uh, you know, it's, it's tongue in cheek, it's a little bit of a joke, but they're teaching people how to do the, the who, uh, you know, 20 second hand hygiene <laughs> on their, on their short shows. And that's, it's just, it's a very good thing. I think it is going to change our world in terms of um, transmission of, of just, you know, cold and flu viruses. You know, it, it is true that this virus has been affecting, uh, it, it is very different from the flu, um, but I do have to do with, deal with the flu every single winter 
uh, it's kind of a saying in infection prevention when you when you see one flu season, you've seen one flu season because it's different every year. So um, I think just in general learning to uh, cover our coughs, to stay away, stay home when we're sick. Um, it's almost a badge of honor for people to go out and still go to work when they're sick. And I think we're gonna see a, a change in that. Bosses aren't going to be expecting people to come to work even though they're sick. We're going to be um, taking care of ourselves. We're gonna be staying home. So I, I think that's a, a really helpful part of, you know, if there's a good side of a pandemic, that's it, that we're learning and we're growing from it. I completely agree, yeah. No, I'm very hopeful that uh, these good habits that we're instilling uh, will, will sustain themselves. Yeah. Um, any closing thoughts before we uh, open to questions? No, I am hope I can answer what people need to know. <laughs> hey, great. So, so a, few, uh, a few questions in the chat. Um, in our closing uh, time here, Dr. Holmes, uh, one was, can you get, from Colleen, can you get COVID-19 multiple times? Um, I think uh, Ms. Schultz would agree. To date, we have not seen any reinfections. Mm -hmm. uh, once the antibodies are in place, we do, the COVID-19 virus, from a public health perspective and epidemiology, it's not mutating. It's very, very slow um, in that regard. So fortunately, uh, once you have built up those antibodies and you've cured yourself, um, you are not going to get infected again. All right. Very good. And from Newton, uh, daycare, daycare centers, uh, are they safe? How do you determine if they're safe? Are they even open? I'll defer to uh, Mrs. Schultz and then I'll add my personal expect or experiences. Mm -hmm. Well, I don't have a child that age, but I do know that some are open. Um, I know we're talking about uh, providing some open daycare for healthcare providers to be able to go to work because of course with schools down and, and you know, preschools down, uh, we're not, we don't have the availability, but I mean, I think you, you have to look at the center's uh, infection prevention practices. How are they, are they teaching the children to wash their hands? Do they clean their hands on the way in? Uh, you've got to look at the prevention strategy, strategies that are going on in those facilities to tell whether, um, whether they're going to prevent spread or not. I don't think there's any guarantees because each one of those children, uh, of course, is going home to their own homes and then they're coming back again. So that in and of itself can be a risk. I, I completely agree. Um, the daycare that my wife and I utilize, they, um, we are no longer near the facility. They meet, you know, meet the child halfway, our daughter. Um, as soon as they take her, they, you know, hand sanitize and they teach her how to wash her hands at 14 months, which is awesome. Mm -hmm. um, she plays with clean toys and then they're running on shorter hours so that they have time to do deeper disinfections, um, you know, in the morning and in the afternoon uh, to try and minimize risk. But I also agree that um, there is, you know, they are still, you know, she's still interacting with kids that are coming from homes that I don't know those individuals. So it's just a matter of, you know, how much do you trust the individuals that um, are sending their kids there and then how much do you trust the daycare facility? In our case, my wife is uh, essential um, and we trust the facility uh, very much to uh, make sure that they're taking all the proper precautions. A great question. Yeah, kind of going along um, that idea, um, should, from Julie, should we wipe down groceries before bringing them into our house? That's a good question. Um, the, if you're talking about containers, I would say yes. Um, the, I talked about that a, a little earlier where, you know, wearing gloves to bring in packaging, like, you know, if we have Amazon packages and UPS still coming, um, you know, you pick them up with gloves, if you can set it out in the sun and let it disinfect that way, that exterior packaging is still, is gonna be sanitized. But when you open it up, you still have something that someone physically handled and put into that box. The same thing for strawberries that come in cases, things like that. So um, disinfecting it, I, I think is always a good idea. Uh, washing fruits, vegetables, um, things along those lines that have been handled um, is never a bad idea, but I can uh, certainly defer to uh, Ms. Schultz. Well, I just, I, I agree. I think you do whatever you can do. I, I did want to say one thing about glove use. Um, 
there's sort of an impression that gloves are magic and they're, they, in, uh, they, in of the, they in of themselves um, are antibacterial. And so if you touch several things with them, that you're still gonna be okay. But you gotta realize that as soon as you touch something with a pair of gloves, they are contaminated. So um, often in infection prevention, like we, we have a really hard time seeing people walk around the hospitals with gloves on. Even with masks on, we've had to uh, change our thinking with that um, because the science behind, um, as Charles said, if you're, if you're wearing a mask to protect yourself, then you would also need goggles because you have mucous membranes in your eyes. If you're wearing a mask to protect other people, then that, that's a good practice um, because it's a source control. If you have it in your lungs, your mouth, your you're going to protect other people. So I think where where the the disconnect can come sometimes is is just by wearing a mask you're going to be protected, or by wearing gloves. I personally don't wear gloves a lot. I just do a lot of hand hygiene because I am more aware of touching my my environment with my hands and cleaning them because that's been my practice for a long time. So just just be aware that um, even if you start out with sterile gloves, they're not sterile for very long. You open them and they're not sterile anymore. So uh, just uh, being aware that um, guidelines for even using gloves are to wash your hands, then put the gloves on, use the gloves, take the gloves off, and wash your hands again. So both the CDC and the WHO will tell you with glove use to wash your hands before and after. I completely agree. Yeah, if you can save yourself from having to waste gloves or, you know, use winter or garden gloves, washing your hands, you know, you can have all the virus in the world on your hands. As long as you, you know, are controlled in the way that you handle it, you wash your hands effectively, you don't touch your face, you're conscientious of, you know, sanitizing whatever it is that you may have touched, um, you're going to be in good, good shape. Yeah. Agreed. So we're going to wrap up our presentation and uh, wanted to thank you, Dr. Holmes and Carrie, for a very timely presentation to, and to everyone for attending the April colloquium. I am posting in the chat a, uh, a link to a survey that we would love for you to go ahead and take. Uh, we'd love to have your feedback on this presentation. Uh, it will also be emailed directly to you and will be found on the CEDL website. Stay tuned to your email inbox, the CEDL website, and the CEDL social media page for details about our next quarter's College of Arts and Sciences Colloquium. Stay healthy and happy first day of spring. Enjoy, uh, enjoy your day, but social isolate as we've learned. And again, thank you, Dr. Holmes and Carrie for um, a very timely presentation. Oh, thank you very much. And I did see in the chat, um, I don't wanna open myself up to uh, be inundated, but um, if individuals still have questions, uh, they can email me, uh, charles.holmes at asher.edu. I'll, uh, I'll do my best to uh, address them in as timely a way as possible. But um, again, I don't have all the answers. So if it's something I can't answer, I will tell you. Uh, I have no idea. <laughs> Very good. Thank you so much.